I do. I love it. Wonderful. So, Lisa, this is, I'm trying to think, you've been here for every book you could except The Flower Net, which I think we drop shipped to you a long time ago. You were one of the earliest supporters of me and my work. And um, you, you know, when my publisher wouldn't send me anywhere, you flew me out here, <laughs> which is such an incredible thing. And then we got to a point where maybe I would pay for the hotel and you'd pay for the flight or you'd pay for the flight and I'd, you know, and then only, I think it's only two books ago that they finally started sending me here, but I'm so grateful. I mean, I just, how incredible is that? That's the advantage of having a not-for-profit bookstore. <laughs> Which, which it is, so uh, it makes it worthwhile. But um, I'm really pleased that um, that's, that Lisa's publisher finally realized that enough of you lived here that if she came here, you would actually show up. Um, <laughs> and part of that part of that is because when we started, uh, we were we were known as a mystery bookstore. And Lisa's first three books are mysteries. For those of you who have not read Flower Net, The Interior, and Dragon Bones, which they, are back there on that table. <laughs> I saw Ooh, a, I sales, a sales pitch from the author. I love it. <laughs> anyway, they really are mysteries. And then she wrote Snowflower and never looked back on the world of crime. Although, although we have come, we have circled back to mystery in Lady Tan. Unfortunately, a wee, a wee bit of mystery. Yeah. We well, okay. We can't tell you about that because we'll spoil it. And also, beyond the wee bit of mystery, there's a particular thing that. Lisa wrote and told me how proud she was of it, and I wish we could mention that, too. But good for you. It was brilliant. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> it's so hard to talk without spoilers. I know. It really is. So long time ago, some of you, when you were upstairs talking to me, I mentioned to you that there was a Dutch author, actually Dutch diplomat. He was the ambassador to Japan, uh, and his name is Robert Van Gulik. And um, from 1910 to 18. He didn't live all that long, 57 years. And he was an authority on Chinese history, and he drew his plots, it says here, from the whole body of Chinese literature, especially from popular detective novels, Chinese detective novels, that appeared in the 17th century. And his protagonist is known as Judge Di, and he is from the Tang Dynasty, which I believe, if I can remember right, is 10th century, isn't it? 900 and some. Lisa tells me she has not actually read Judge D. I have memorized Judge D. I have read them so many times. But what's interesting, and the reason I brought it up, A, if you can find them, I really recommend you read them, since you like Lisa's work. Uh, they're a little hard to find. The University of Chicago had republished them, and you may have to look for them as used books and other things. I'm holding on to the Phantom of the Temple. But what's really interesting is that reading Judge D and then reading Lady Tang, there wasn't a lot of advance in China in terms of social structure and medical and detection from 900 to 1500. Or even to 2023. I mean, <laughs> you know, the thing is that um, traditional Chinese medicine has been around for 2000 years. Uh, there's also the book that I mentioned in Lady Tan, um, The Washing Away of Wrongs, which was the first ever book of forensics in the world, but was still used in China all the way until, but when I say the last century, does that mean 23 years ago hmm. or 123 years ago? Right. I don't know, but it was That's used until the last century as a, you know, as one of the main forensic um textbooks in China. So, you know, they have such a long history and mm -hmm. such an old culture that um, things, di you know, in some ways don't change very much. Right. No, I was, so, and the other thing that uh, strikes me and is an important part of Lady Tang, Tang, is it Tang or Tang? Tang. Tang, thank you. Um, is that the family structure and the bureaucratic structure, you know, the, the way that men would take exam, went to schools, um, took exams, rose in the incredible government bureaucracy was the same in Judge D's day as it is in Lady Tan's day. And, and all the way up until I think it's 1905 when they finally eliminated the Imperial Scholar 
um, system. But, you know, the other thing is that that kind of structure of society also was the structure of family, like you pointed out. And part of this is because of Confucius and how he sort of laid out how society and culture should be. And, and so that really permeated um, society. And he said, you know, the, if you, you follow the emperor, then you follow the, your parents. And, and, you know, there was this whole hierarchy, but that, that also, you know, again, played into how people lived in their families. So after Snowflower, you've been kind of advancing towards more towards 20th century history. What inspired you to go back and write Lady John, who is the earliest of the... By far the earliest. So you have to kind of scroll back in time a little bit. I thought I knew what the next book was going to be after the Island of Sea Women. I do think about books for a very long time before I decide this is the one. So Island of Sea Women, I thought about that for eight years. Uh, Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane, 20 years before I decided this is the one. I mean, really, that one it was my way in. Anyway, I had been quietly collecting material for what I thought was going to be the next book. Um, and then the pandemic hit. And um, actually, I was out on book tour. I was supposed to be on book tour for six weeks. And I left on March 10th, 2020. And I went to five states in five days and was sent home. And the whole you know, country felt closed down. The world closed down. And... The problem with that idea that I had was that it was, and I'd been collecting material on, was it was going to require a trip deep, deep, deep into a very, very remote part of China. No way I could go in 2020. No way. In, I mean, I, I still would be very reluctant to go anywhere in the world that remote. So that was just out of the question, which meant that I was at home feeling very much at loose ends. Many of us were, of course, you know, essential workers. There are some people who are essential workers, but the majority of us, not so much. Writers, absolutely not essential, turns out. And so, and I don't mean to sound melodramatic about this, but I just was like, my life is over. You know, I can't go to China to do research. All the libraries, all the research institutions, all the archives, everything was closed and actually remained closed throughout the entire writing of this. So I, there I was, you know, home alone with my husband 24 hours a day and just like, I don't know. And, you know, my kids, I said, wouldn't you like to come and visit your mother? No, we don't want to be the ones who kill you. So, you know, I did what any logical person would do. I bought my first ever pair of pajamas, you know, and my second pair. Anyway, it was not until October of that year, and I was just walking through my office, um, and I have a whole wall of research books, and the spine of one of the books jumped out at me. I don't know why. Gray jacket with slightly darker gray lettering, nothing to jump out, but it did. And I pulled it down, reproducing women, pregnancy, and childbirth in the Ming Dynasty. And I opened it up. I'd had it on my shelf for 10 years and had never opened it. And I thought, well, you know, we're in the middle of a pandemic. My life is over. This is the time. This is the moment. And I sat down right then to start reading. And I got to page 19, and there was a mention of a woman doctor, Tan Yan Shun, who, um, first of all, a woman doctor in the Ming Dynasty, right there, pretty amazing, 500 years ago. But when she turned 50, something I also appreciated, uh, she, in 1511, she published a book of her cases, her medical cases. And I set the book down, I went to the internet, I poked around, I saw that that book was still in print, not only in Chinese, but also in English. And although you know I'm a huge supporter of independent bookstores, I did go to that other place. <laughs> and I had it within 24 hours, and so... <laughs> Instead of thinking about something for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, this was 26 hours. And I knew what the next one was going to be. But what's interesting also is that in, there are echoes of certainly Snowflower. In fact, um, for those of you who remember Snowflower for foot binding more than you might remember it for the secret language, 
This book is actually more about that, and I thought we might want to talk about it some because um, one of the reasons, I, I guess the basic question would be why? You know, why did anybody think it was a good idea? What was, you mentioned several times in the book that men were sexually stimulated by watching these women on these shoes about that big toddling along. Why? Okay, so there are actually several reasons. So um, the first is that it was actually an incredible economic status symbol for men. You know, man could say, I am so wealthy, look, my wife has bound feet, meaning she didn't have to work. Or I am so incredibly wealthy that not only does my wife have bound feet, but even our servants have bound feet. That was a very, very wealthy man. Um, there was that whole weird sexual component to bound feet. You know, women did have to walk in a particular way. Uh, how graphic are we going to get here? <laughs> Let's just say it had an effect on some muscle somewhere in their body, <laughs> apparently. But also anything you can think of that they could have done with those feet, they did. I mean, it's, and I've stayed away from ever writing about that because it's like it makes my hair stand on end. <laughs> But um, let's see, what else? It obviously kept women from running away. It, but it was also, if you can phrase it in a different way, that a woman would always need to lean on a man. You know, she would always need him to help However, her. Interestingly enough, it was women who did it to Well, yes, women. so I'm not done. Oh, okay. This was the one thing a mother could do to, for her daughter to possibly give her a better chance at life. You know, if she could give her daughter a pair of perfectly bound feet, then her daughter could marry into a better family, have a better life. The alternatives were not great. And then there was one last thing, which is women liked their bound feet. Uh, they used to have the equivalent of, um, you know, beauty contests in towns and villages, and the women would get behind a curtain, or and uh, all you would see were just the three inches of, of feet, and um, the judges would walk up and down, and then finally they'd see, ah, here is the most beautiful woman in our village, and the curtain would come down and it might be a woman in her 70s, 80s, and, or 90s. And here's the thing, bound feet never change. They didn't gain weight, they didn't sag, they didn't get wrinkles. As a woman of a certain age myself, I wouldn't mind if just my one part of my body would stay where it was so, <laughs> once was. And so they, you know, there was that just even at a purely vanity level that women liked that aspect. It so was, lots it, of different reasons. Yeah, really. and it was incredible. I, the reason I was waving at Jacob as he's back there is that there is a lady who would like you to turn off the fan and I can't possibly reach it, but you can. <laughs> if you could wander up here. I saw you making a faint pass and trying to turn it off. So Sorry, it's a little too breezy there. Or maybe Patrick can do it. Right. Right. Sorry, we had a little, little interruption there. Um, so the, the thing that I don't think that I picked up in Snowflower as well as I might have is that I thought that once the binding process was done and people survived it, that that was kind of it. But that wasn't the case. And in this book, you make it clear that it needed lifetime maintenance. And there is a, there is a woman who doesn't do that and who dies of um, gangrene, I'm assuming gangrene, an infection from a bone splinter that, you know, results. So it did, it was dangerous, and not just right. at the time of happening, but, you know, it could be dangerous all your life. Yeah, it, it was completely dangerous your entire life. It was a lifelong project. And you, you know, every four days, a woman would unwrap her feet, clean them, really cut the nails. The other thing is all these bones had been broken. And so often these little slivers of bones, you know, the main goal was never to break the flesh. So little slivers of bone might come through and they had these like um, foot binding, uh, you know, like how you have travel um, nail care things with clippers and scissors and stuff. So it was like that. And instead of a, just a regular emery board, it was an emery board to sh sand down bone that broke through your skin. Well, she asked. I, yeah. 
I wasn't going to bring it up. But then the other thing is if you think about it, your foot has been rolled up into, you know, just rolled up. And so your, your toenails are really digging in. And so the, it was so important to keep those nails really short. And if, you know, if you've ever gone like too long without cutting your nails and it's like cutting into you and it hurts so much, but if it broke the skin, now it was exposed. And the, you know, if you, China can be very hot, but also extraordinarily humid. And so think about, you know, this foot rolled up like almost like a sock and in really hot weather, really humid weather where it's getting kind of yucky in there. And that if, if you did break the skin, you were in serious trouble. So this book is not entirely for the faint hearted, right? No. Uh, but I mean, you know, I, I think it, it was, I'm, I'm just amazed that I, I didn't really think through all of the consequences of doing this to a foot. Now, many years ago, the Metropolitan Museum of Art had, because uh, they have a costume institute, I don't know if any of you ever gone to it, but it's terrific. And they did a dragon robe show. And in that, they not only had these little teensy shoes for the foot binding, but they also had the nail guards. Because the other thing that could happen to women, especially those married to rich guys, was that their fingernails would be so long that they basically couldn't use their hands either. And so, you know, they almost, it was really like... But that was really imperial, you yeah. know. That, I mean, that's a very rare woman who did n so little that her nails could grow that long. But they actually had guards yeah, for them. Yeah, I know yeah, that. I know. But it Probably wasn't like, it wasn't like any of us in this room, probably, we're not going right. to be able to. <laughs> so we'll move on to the most dangerous part of the whole thing for women, which was basically um, pregnancy and childbirth. And that's really Lady Tan's, to a great degree, her, her specialty. Focus, mm -hmm. Her specialty, yeah. Um, there weren't any actual obstetricians or whatever in those days. And the men, according to your book, men were not allowed to touch the women or even be in the same room with them. So male doctors, and, and this is, in, you know, until very recently in, in traditional Chinese medicine in China, um, were not allowed to be in the same room with or see a woman patient, woman or girl. And so what they would do is, you know, sit behind a curtain or behind a screen or better yet out in the hallway. And then a girl's father or a woman's husband would act as the go-between. And he would come and, you know, the doctor would say, go ask her this. And the husband would go over and ask his wife. She'd give the answer and go back and forth. Now, I just want to say, I love my husbands and sons very much. I mean, I only have one husband. Sorry. I love my husband. <laughs> I love my husband and sons. I hope he doesn't watch this. He's going to be very worried because he's home alone. Like, what do you mean? Um, I love them very much, but I would not want them to act as the go-between between, between me and any doctor really, but especially the gynecologist. And so this was, you know, it, it wasn't terribly effective. So one of the things that made Tanya and Shun so unique is that she could actually be in the room with her patient. She could see, you know, were they flushed? Were they pale? Were they swollen? Did they have a rash? She could smell them. She could feel their pulse. And in, in Chinese medicine, there are 26 pulses. But a male doctor, the only time he really could feel a woman's pulse is if she was at death's door. And then they would wrap her wrist, actually in, usually in binding cloth, and stick it through a curtain. And he would try to feel it through those layers of cloth, not terribly effective. But then the main thing is that she could really talk woman to woman to her patients. And she had been herself through every phase of a woman's life. She'd been a little girl, adolescent. Um, had given birth, menopause. I mean, so she she had experienced all of these things in her own body, and the just usual trials and tribulations that come with life herself. And so she had this way of communicating with her patients that was unlike uh, what the male doctors could do. I mean, they just couldn't do it. So tell us about her life. We've talked about the medical issues, but you know, this yeah. is a biography in a way. 
Yeah, it is sort of. I mean, it's definitely an imagining because there's not a whole lot that's been written about her or has survived. You know, there is her little book and it has some for a couple of forwards by male relatives and a couple of afterwards by also male relatives, but also a um, introduction that she wrote. And when she was eight years old, she went to live with her grandparents and at night, she would recite poetry to her grandfather when he drank wine. And one night, apparently, and I'm going to paraphrase, but it's pretty close. He said, this girl is very smart. She shouldn't be limited to embroidery and reciting poetry. I want to teach her my medicine. And he was what was known as a literati doctor, a doctor who learns to be a doctor by reading books. But his wife, Tanya Chen's grandmother, was a hereditary doctor, and she'd learned from her parents, who'd learned from their parents, and so on. And so she really, you know, she really was her grandmother's student. And again, you know, was in the inner chambers with women and girls and learning at her, mother, at her grandmother's side. So how big was the household? I mean, you know, she wasn't able to, like, there was not a hospital or whatever where she was practicing. So what was the size of the household where she um, grew up and then married and then? Well, the, no you know. one knows exactly, but scholars believe that the majority of her cases are the women and girls who live in her husband's home. And so, you know, this was an elite family, a pretty wealthy family. And so they would have lived in one of these big compound homes where you would live with anywhere between 40 and 100 of your husband's closest relatives. Yeah. And then the servants who took care of them. So, uh, you know, many, most of her cases are these, uh, you know, and she describes each one. This is a little girl in an elite, an elite household. She's suffering from food damage caused by excessive love. You know, so she describes the girl, the, the patient gives the remedy with the recipe and then what the results were. And so the majority of the cases are these elite women and girls. Some of them are concubines some are wives, there's some spinster ladies in there, and the servants who took care of them. But there are a couple of cases that are very different. So there's a woman who holds the tiller on a ship, another one who's a brick and tile maker. And, you know, we haven't really, well, we started to talk at the beginning about what the culture was like and it was so influenced by Confucius at that time and Confucian thought with it permeated society, culture, family. And um, you know, if you've read any of my books, you he, great man, I'm not gonna say he wasn't, but he really did not care for women. I think that's fair to say. And so he has all these sayings, like an educated woman is a worthless woman. Um, a good woman should never take more than three steps beyond her front door. So if she could never take three steps beyond her front gate, how did she meet that tiller woman? How did she meet the, the um, brick and tile maker? And so that actually, from the very first day, was one of those things where it's like, I have to figure out how she did that. Like what, how, you know, how did she get out to do that? And nobody knows the answer. I had to envision it. You were allowed to make it up since nobody actually knows how it happened. But you know, the sheer size of these um, family compounds was amazing, not only in terms of the, you know, gardens and the buildings and all, but, um, the marriages were mostly arranged, at least at the highest level, so she marries into this family. But a man could have wives, and then he could also have concubines, and so there could be lots of children involved. I mean, you know, if you, we tend to think it's like just the Ottomans, you know, that live like that, but that's not true at all. It was also the case in, in China. Um, and so she has to deal with... Um, you know, other women that her husband. I I love the moment. There was no sure thing contraceptive, and I really love the moment. This is not a spoiler. When she ushers a concubine into her husband's bedchamber and closes the door, and I thought, yay! Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah and she's kind of done with it. That's you know? right. She's kind of yeah. done with that part of her life. She's like, okay, you know, I'm going to get him a concubine because I've got other stuff to do. <laughs> 
but she'd also survived, you know, she had, because that was the number one killer of women, and so she'd made it, you know, she she lived through pregnancies and all the rest, and she was ready to hand him over to, you know, somebody else. But then, you know, if there, she was going to wind up in her role, you know, taking care of whatever consequences might result from the concubine, if the concubine got pregnant or whatever. So, And also the terminology of um, women's bodies and what it was to be pregnant and so forth. Were those, you know, words in her book? Because, I, I mean, you call them things yes, like the child like the palace. the child palace. But, you know, the child palace is still the term for the uterus in China. Still used. Yeah. Child palace. There's, there's really some interesting interesting language. Um, and as you read the book, of course, you get into it. You know, you get get the rhythm of it. But um, So you do actually send her at some point on a journey. And obviously, you've had to imagine that. Um, was there any chance at all that she did do that? or No, she didn't. I mean, she, I do send her up to Beijing uh, to... And again, this, well, she just, we're just going to say she has to go to Beijing. You can imagine what, who, and might be there, who might be there that she might have to take care of. But one of the things I was thinking about, and again, this was really in my imagining and my trying to think of the vision for the book, um, was how I wanted to hit every um, sort of... Um, societal um, position for any woman, you know, from the lowest servant to working women, concubines, wives, um, the, those kind of spinster aunt widows, all the way up to the empress, and you know, ladies in waiting, all the way up. And that it really doesn't matter when you lived. It's today, it's a thousand years ago, 10,000 years ago, 10,000 years from today, doesn't matter what time or where in the world you live, women are connected by, we're connected by our physiology. And that we all go through these physical stages in life. Not everybody decides to have a baby. Not everybody wants to have a baby or have, you can have a baby. But we do have these things in common. And if you do ever get pregnant, there is also something true. It doesn't matter whether you are a village woman who gives birth in the corner and of the her little hut and then gets up and goes back out to the fields that day. Uh, or like the women I wrote about an Island of sea women who would, you know, sometimes just have their babies in the water while they were diving, working. Um, you know, you could be like that or you could be all the way up there like the Empress, right? Or like any of us who are supposed to get the best, you know, really good treatment in hospitals today. But that, that baby still has to come out somehow and that that doesn't change over time, right? And that is something that unites all of these women in this room. Yeah, I remember, any of you read Pearl Buck and the Good Earth umpteen years ago? Do you remember where, you know, she had a baby and just kept right on, you know, I don't remember if she was in the field or whatever she was doing, but, you know, um, so, yeah. And they, most of the world is still like that. You know, most of the world still. And here's, you know, we're talking, we've, I feel like we've sort of been implying that Western medicine is really great and advanced, but it's really only about a hundred years ago right. that women started having babies in hospitals. And it's, you know, right around that time that, um, ob you know, obstetrics came in, in and that men really started to take over the care of women's bodies. But really, before that, it had been all in the hands of midwives. Scarily enough, women used to die of something called puerperal fever, P-U-E-R-P-A-L. And it was simply because people assisting them to give birth didn't wash their hands. Yeah. And once then, that was, I think, in the early 1900s, 
that anybody figured out that, you know, just basic sanitary. Remember how we all were during COVID? I mean, we're washing our mail, we're washing our vegetables, you know, whatever, we're washing our hands continually and all. People didn't think of that. And well, you know, even today, worldwide, one of the number one causes of death for women is, um, uh, again, the same thing, but actually, um, um, tetanus, lockjaw, because they're giving birth over dirt, in dirt, and that, you know, they, that, and so, you know, and I can't remember what it's called in this book. Um, I I can't remember. It has some interesting name um, that was the the name at the time, but that even today, worldwide, is one of the number one causes of death for women who are giving birth. So, um, we've been talking about women and medicine and childbirth and all. But one of the interesting things I think about the book is the look at the whole economic picture of um, the family. You know, how how are these families making their money? Is it agricultural? Is it, you know, are they all getting stipends from the men? Obviously, because the women are, are not working for money, they're, they're labor, but they're not actually salary. So, you know, you have a lot to say about the economic structure of the time in these families. Right. And also the sort of the difference between, uh, um, you know, some, a family of imperial scholars, uh, Tanya Shun did come from a very distinguished line of imperial scholars, her father, her uncle, her grandfather, her great grandfather, I mean, very, very high up in the um, imperial scholar system. And then, she, but she was married into a mercantile family. And, you know, no, again, there's no one here now to tell us why, but it, that meant that that family was, you know, very wealthy. And they they um, grew mulberry trees. They had silk farms. They, um, you know, processed silk. They they um, created silk and sold it everywhere. So they were extraordinarily wealthy. I th what scholars believe is that they married her in. Um, because her family would have such connections that then her husband, who was very young, who was studying to be an imperial scholar, hopefully would pass the exams and that, that her family would be able to help place him into um, a good position. It sounds like he wasn't terribly brilliant. You know, he was a nice guy up to a point, but I mean, but he wasn't, you know, he, he wasn't off the charts but that her grandfather in particular did help him get a position in the um, Board of Punishments. Right. Well, I mean, it wasn't a love match, as we've already said. It's an, uh, an arranged marriage. Right, an and how arranged old marriage. was she? She was like she was 14, 15. 15 or 14. Yeah. So, you know, well, but, you know, when women came into, um, you know, estrus, so to speak, um, you know, they people didn't live that long. Yeah. And so, you know, they did marry a lot younger. We think today that, you know, marriage at 14 or 15, you know, is a crime. But back then, it was only sensible, really, to... If you were only going to live to 35, you'd better get on it, you know? <laughs> but the thing is, she actually lived to be 96. So remarkable today, but in the 1500s, just extraordinary. I think that's one of those things that shows she must have been a pretty good doctor. Absolutely true. Um, and of course, because it was a mercantile family, her husband ended up, or at least some of them, they traveled because, you know, they had to, they had to take stuff to market and um, all the rest of it. There was uh, China, I've always thought until, you know, was one of the great capitalist societies of the world up until recent times. And now it's, it's still sort of bubbling along under rigid control. But, uh, you know, the Chinese are famous merchants and um, you know, producers of commodity. I mean, you know, paper, fireworks, writing, ink, all those great things that a very advanced culture, way mm -hmm. better than the Western world for a really long time. And then, you know, what happened after, um, why is it, do you think, it have nothing to do with your book, why was the Western world so easily able to overcome China in 
Well, I, I mean, that's a whole centuries. long discussion, but, you know, the Qing, but we'll just right? say the Qing dynasty, that last yeah. um, imperial dynasty was very corrupt. It was very weak. They made some very bad decisions. Um, the type, first Taiping, I'm sorry, but they, you know, there was dis, the disruption of the Taiping rebellion. There was the first Boxer rebellion, the second one. And then with the result of the second one, there were these concessions made so that Hong Kong was opened up, um, yeah, Shanghai, uh, Shanghai yeah. was opened up. And once those were open, um, Britain could bring in opium, which did not help that country at all. And so it just got weaker and weaker. But that was really the turning point was the second Boxer right. Rebellion. I only brought it up because I think many of us, you know, don't, Many people in the Western world don't understand just how incredibly sophisticated and, you know, rich and advanced China was for right. millennia, you know. Um, it's interesting to see, you know, whatever is going to happen right now, for example. Um, we're in an interesting, interesting phase there. Right. right. Yeah. Has anybody checked the news to see what's going on with the Wagner Group? I, I, I checked I think it out they, before they I stepped, came. They stepped down and is it, what is it, Belarus? Just, yeah, Belarus. They, they went to Belarus and they're going to have amnesty and they can live where they want and nothing bad's going to happen to them. Ah, okay. But they didn't, they didn't topple Putin. They didn't. Right. But, well, no, not necessarily. It might have been worse. I mean, that's the thing. You can't, you can't really be sure. But um, I've, and the only reason I mentioned is that I'm sure China is watching all this and wondering what its policies will be. But mm -hmm. um, at the time you're writing in, in the Ming Dynasty, did they have imperial ambitions beyond China? Did you run into much of that? No. And, you know, the West hadn't gotten there yet. Right. So they, I mean, yes, they had um, ambitions, but here, here's the thing. I can't remember the name of the book, but they got here first and they sort of came, they hit the West Coast. Oh, there was that 14, whole arm. Uh, what whole, is it, yeah, the port, some, something, something like that. But, but, yeah. And, you know, they came, they saw and it was like, yeah, no, we're going home. Yeah, it's like <laughs> nothing good there. <laughs> and so, the, you know, they, they, they didn't need the rest of the world. I mean, it was called the Middle Kingdom for a reason. It was the middle of the universe, and they had everything. So anything else you'd like to say about the book? As usual, I've rambled around, so sorry. There was not a there was no through line in this we, discussion. We, we didn't talk about the friendship at all. Let's do that. Uh, so there's a friend, of course, because I wrote it. <laughs> and... Um, you know, I do write about women, I write about mothers and daughters and sisters, but I do keep returning to friendship. And I, th this is a relationship that I think is unique in women's lives, that we will tell our friend something that we wouldn't tell our boyfriend, our lover, our mother, our children, our husband, you know, any of those people. And it's a very particular kind of intimacy. And of course, whenever you have your heart open like that, you are open and vulnerable to being hurt. And so as wonderful as that friendship is, there are always those kind of dark shadow sides, you know, those little shadows in the corners. And wherever I see those corners, that's where I want to go. Um, you know, I was signing books before in the, in the back room for people who'd pre-ordered and somebody wanted just a line from the book and a, and a signature. And the one I used was, and it's in the novel, it takes a lifetime to make a friend, but you can lose one in an hour. And I just thought, yep, that's true. You know, that's really true. And that's true, again, sort of across millennia. Yeah, well, it really is. Actually, there's a lot of contemporary fiction, especially crime fiction involving mean girls and, you know, the awful things that women can do to each other um, in a way that, I mean, that men... They just don't do it. No, it's a, it's an entirely different well, sort of and wounding. I, and I do think, I mean, if we're just thinking of this time period where all of these, if you, again, think of one of these big compound homes where all the women in the household are spending all day long in the inner chambers with the beautiful young wives, the long-suffering wives, 
all those concubines, and you're all in the room together. I mean, I, I, I just, day after day after day, and no way to get away from them either. You know, you couldn't just say, I think I'll just go to my room and watch TV. You know, you just couldn't do it. You had to be in there. And the, um, Chinese literature and uh, certainly, you know, if you ever watch those Chinese sort of dramas on television, you see that as a continuing theme of how, um, you know, the concubines were plotting to kill somebody. I mean, and this happened at, again, it's not in the lowest level of society, but if you had enough money to have one of those kinds of homes all the way up to uh, the Forbidden City, which was, you know, a place historically known for women, you know, killing women, ganging up on women. They, they, they took the whole mean thing, mean girl thing to an extreme. Yeah, but it wasn't just about ganging up on other women. It was about, you know, for children and prefer, you know, right. because and there's a very, the, the very hierarchical yeah. structure. So if you had children by various wives and so forth, there would always be competition to see who's, you know. who's going to be the heir. Right. Who's, um, you know, and if the concubine, I mean, even in my own family, so it would be my, uh, great, my grand, my great grandfather's brother, Feng Yin, um, he had three wives in China and one here. And he did end up having nine sons, no, no daughters, all nine sons. But the first son was born to one of the concubines. And so in the, that family to this day, those children, those boys are, you know, well, they're old now, but you know, they're number one, number two, number three, number four. And there has always, all the way to today, a sort of, you know, there's number, there is number one who was the number one, but for the sake of the family, they made number two the number one. So number two is number one and number, he's dead now, and number one, one was number two, but that was just to try to maintain some peace within the family. There's a wonderful series by a man named Ian Hamilton, a Canadian writer, and his lead character is a woman called Ava Lee, uh, who is a financial expert, and there are thrillers that are driven by finances primarily and money. They're absolutely wonderful. Um, but she is the daughter of a second wife, um, and her mother couldn't get along with the father's first wife in Hong Kong, and so moved to first to Vancouver and then to Toronto. And then there's a third wife and a third. So this is a modern Chinese girl who is trying to cope oh, yeah, with but all I, this of this. Yeah, but this has nothing to do with being Chinese. I mean, let's just for fun take the Murdoch family. You know, it's not. No, but, well, no. but but you know the 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 children of the first family. It's who's going to take over, and the children of. Uh, Wendy Deng, um, you know, you never even hear about them. I'm sure they're lovely little kids, you know, not so little anymore. But that, but I think you see that still. Yeah, but that, that's more like serial monogamy rather than um, polygamy right. has but created I'm, that. But I think it's the idea of what the position of those children it you know is and that first wife and the eldest son for example and who's going to take you know succession right i mean i never saw it but i've heard about See, it it goes on forever if any of you ever watch the lion in winter for example yeah. or henry the second's children are all quarreling that, that's one of my favorite moments in in theater in the movies I don't, i'll digress why not um peter o'toole you know is is henry and so he's on stage, and his children are plotting to kill him and try to figure out which one of them is going to succeed. And his wife and his mistress are quarreling in the background. I can't remember what all else awful was going on. And he strolls up to the front of the stage, and he looks out, and he says, I don't know what historians are going to write about my life, but I'll tell you this. It's going to read a lot better than it's lived. <laughs> which I thought pretty much summed up how, you know, how it would feel to be in that. So let me um, digress again. We, The Island of Sea Women, for most of you probably here have read it, takes place on the island of Jeju. Jeju? 
Right. So for those of you who have not had the joy of watching Extraordinary Attorney Wu, which is possibly one of the very best things ever put on television, drama number one, I'm happy to tell you that there are two parts of the 16-part first season that take place on Jeju. And it's worth watching. If for nothing else, they fly to Jeju. And um, part of the joy of this series is there are whales and dolphins, animated whales and dolphins. The, the, the Kore it's Korean production. The Koreans are genius with adding all that to it. But if you like the Island of Sea Women, I think you, have you seen it? I haven't. I only saw, oh my God. Only saw the first couple of episodes. So well, I haven't gotten to Jeju yet. Maybe I'll have to start watching you really, it. Yeah, I think it's 12 and 13 or something. Anyway, for those of you who would like to see what Jeju is really like um, today, um, it's worth yeah, it's one of the great things about all these foreign uh, dramas and so forth is their travelogues, and you get to enjoy them. Yay. So what else would you like to say about your book? I don't know. Do we want to see if they have any questions? Well, we could, but let me ask you one last question. Okay, yeah, is, I, don't, I don't know what else. What, what have I missed? Somebody should tell me. What, 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 is, what we've missed is talking about what you're doing next. Ah. Uh, actually, I, there is something I want to say, which... Because the world was shut down, the research for this book was completely different than any research I had done before. And I do think in the same way that that book popped out at me, that there was this element to me of sort of fate, fortune, destiny, just good luck that kept happening over and over again. And uh, for example, I, the, one of the first things I did was I wanted to try to find the woman who had translated um, miscellaneous records of a female doctor into English. And of course, I went to the internet, I'm poking all around. Of all the places she could live in the world, she lived in Santa Monica, 10 minutes from my house. And so although we couldn't meet, it was way before vaccines. We t you know, talked on Zoom. We didn't have Zoom before. But we talked on Zoom a lot. Um, there were professors around the world, but I often go back to this one at um, uh, Harvard, who was the you know, chair of the department, uh, who helped me so much. And we were on Zoom a lot. And I... I, it's, I don't know why I'm slow on the uptake, I guess, but it was only yesterday when I was flying here that I, that I thought, you know, maybe they were having the same equivalent of, that I was feeling of my life is over. And, you know, they'd bought their pajamas too. And, but th 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 there, here I was somebody that they could talk about their, the things that they really know about. And so I could ask them, like, how long would it take to go on the Grand Canal from Wuxi to uh, Beijing in 1496? And then somebody would help me. Or, you know, what I needed somebody to write a letter. But could you write and send a letter? How would you send a letter in the 14, late 1400s. I mean, that's not something you can find easily. Was there a postal system? Not really. <laughs> no, no. I mean, there was, there sort of was, but, you know, the emperor could send stuff. Um, but mostly people would hire a, a private courier. So that, again, meant you had to be pretty wealthy. And it turned out it was faster to hire people who could run over great distances than to hire horses because the terrain was so rough and people, humans could navigate the, the rough terrain and mountains where horses couldn't. Right, that's like the Japanese running down. I've actually been on that road in yeah. Japan. So, where, so it was just that, the same thing. That, yeah. that people were just incredibly helpful and um, just these things would happen. Like I'm, I am on Twitter. Instagram, Facebook, but on Twitter, there's a site I follow called um, China in Pictures, and he posts these um, old photographs and sometimes videos of China. Well, I wasn't too worried about not being able to go to Wuxi because it's it's a, what's known as a water town. This is in the Yangtze Delta where they have, um, it's you know, just sort of envision the Mississippi Delta, where you have little towns along the tributaries, and China's the same way along the Yangtze Delta, but these are like little miniature 
Venices? Venice? What's the plural of Venice? I don't know. Venici, okay. Plural, okay. So, what to say that again? Venici. So, like many, many Venici uh, there. And um, so, although I couldn't go to Wuxi, I had been to many of those water towns. I'd stayed in many of those water towns, especially when I was working on Peony and Love. But anyway, one day I'm on Twitter, and, and I was also thinking, I don't think there are going to be too many buildings that have survived from the Ming Dynasty in Wuxi. You know, it's a, now a town of six million people. It just didn't seem very likely. Anyway, one day he posted a photo of a Ming Dynasty building. I don't know him, but I, he follows me too. I sent him a message and said, are there any other buildings that you know of in Wuxi from the Ming Dynasty? And the next day he sent me a list of 40 uh, Ming Dynasty buildings, wow. sites, gardens, but not just like a list, videos, photographs, um, links, uh, you know, of, of the canals in Wuxi during the day, at night from 1950 in black and white. I mean, it was just this incredible thing. And it's, again, I just think that in this time when we were so isolated that those, um, I needed help, but there were also people who may have had time or the, the willingness to help in a way that they might not have, or, you know, might not today. And the technology to support it. Right, and the technology to support it. So that, that was completely different. Right. So we've talked a lot about history and all kinds of issues here, but, you know, if that, this is a novel. It's a wonderful story. There's a great narrative. There are wonderful characters in it. It's a journey for this woman from a very young child, you know, through a big part of her life, through her marriage, through all kinds of things. Then, you know, read it as a novel. You'll yeah. like the history part, and that's what we've been talking about. But the novel part is extraordinary. And one more thing that Lisa has not mentioned, but which I think she might want to tell you a little bit about, is while all this has been going on, Lisa wrote an opera that was premiered in Los Angeles. So tell us about but the I, opera. Actually, I wrote it 20 years ago, and it premiered, well, now it would be 21 years ago. It was an L.A. opera production uh, 20 years ago. And then it was supposed to be, be the inaugural event for the Chinese garden, the expansion of the Chinese garden at the Huntington, if you've ever been there in Pasadena, and they have that incredible Chinese garden. And, but COVID came, and then it was delayed and delayed. And then finally, you know, last year, it was mounted in the Chinese garden as a revival, and it was spectacular, I must say that. Uh, it was just really beautiful, and it looks like they're going, that the Huntington wants to have this as their main contribution during the Los Angeles Olympics. So, yes, so it looks like, you know, fingers crossed, a third production in a, in a couple of years. So tell us about the opera. So the opera is, um, you know, based on, on, it's called On Gold Mountain, based on the, you know, my very first book, On Gold Mountain. So On Gold Mountain is my first book, which tells the history of the Chinese in America through the eyes of my family. That's a very long book that covers over 100 years. So we, we I just narrowed it down to the love story between my great-grandparents and, um yeah, I don't know what else to say except uh, this was outside. There was a full moon. It was just unbelievable to be a part of it. Uh, his name is Nathan Wong, and uh, I don't know a lot about. I let me put it to you a different way. I know zero about music. <laughs> I do love opera, and again, you have to go back 20 years, so he would sometimes send me a cassette with a piece of music that he had written, and then I would sit in my car in the garage where I could put the tape in the uh, car, um, and then I would count one, two, three, four, at, to see how many syllables I could get to a line, because I, I couldn't read music. Wow. Well, it turned out it was a great collaboration. Yeah. So. 
Wonderful. All right. So questions. Patrick has a microphone. So any of you like to stick up your hand, he'll come and find you and you can ask Lisa a question. Sir, sir. Actually, one of my questions was going to ask if there were still remaining uh, palaces like the one you described. And you said yes, and you have pictures. Can you post those on Facebook? I follow you so, on Facebook. So she asked, I don't think that microphone is on, but um, she asked, uh, are there still palaces or these grand houses still in China, and would I post them? And actually, I have a whole section on my website called Step Inside the World of um, Lady Tan, where I have photographs of these big homes, of the marriage bed, of uh, clothing, you know, Ming Dynasty clothing, stuff about Ming Dynasty hairstyles, makeup, videos of how to make traditional Chinese makeup. So all kinds of stuff like that is right there on my website. Oh, God, I forgot to ask that question. I'll hold it for just one moment. A big part of this book takes place in the marriage bed, which, as far as I could work out, is a room. This one is the one that is based on is a real one that's in my family that is actually three rooms. The first room is where the servant sleeps on the floor. The next room was the dressing room. And then the third room was the sleeping platform and chamber. And may, the one in our family is, has about 20 different types of wood, all carved, very, very elaborate. And uh, it, once you're in the inner, the sleeping chamber it's surrounded on all sides by paintings on on silk showing you know scenes of domestic happiness so i uh, love nothing sexy <laughs> was clean no but but you know uh, a couple walking by a stream or she's playing an instrument and he's writing poetry and this house uh, the marriage bed was where I played with my cousins when I was a kid. It was our playhouse. And it's where my kids and their cousins played. Uh, and so, you know, this is something we've had in my family. It is actually a Ming Dynasty bed. And we've had in our family for uh, at least uh, about 130 years. So basically it's a smaller structure it's like, within it's a room. It's a smaller structure within a room and a way to have privacy. Hi, my mom, Missy. My name is Raya. Um, my question for you is, what are some daily practices or disciplines that you do as a writer, um, maybe even monthly or yearly, so that you can kind of keep that skill fresh and keep it going? And then I just have one more other question is that, have you always wanted to be a writer? So that's something you developed later in life or something you like, you were five, six years old and you just, you just wanted to be a writer. Okay. So I remember the first, last, second one, what was the first one? Oh, rituals. Now, did everybody hear in the back? Okay. So the rituals, I don't actually have many rituals. I make a very good cup of tea. I'm a serious tea drinker. I started writing Tea Girl of Hummingbird Lane as a tea lover and ended up a total tea snob. So I make myself seriously good tea. And then I... Uh, start to work. And so these books typically take about two years. The majority of time is spent on the research. The writing is actually the least amount of time. And then in the middle is the editing. That's when I really create the story, I think, for me. That's just, it, it, people, everybody's different. You could come to all of the events here and every writer would tell you something different. I don't journal. I don't do any, I don't do character, you know, backstories for people. Um, I mean, I feel like these characters all have a backstory, but I don't do that as a separate project. I just really try to think about um, the plot. And then once I have enough of the research, then I'm, I'm just trying to be in their clothes as I write and just trying to just be in them. And if I can do that, then that, you know, I don't know if that's like a process or what, I don't know if that answers your question. And then the second is, did I always want to be a writer? So my mother was a writer. My mother's father was a writer. I feel like I had a lifelong apprenticeship. I sometimes joke around, you know, it's a good thing they weren't plumbers, but 
why couldn't they have been brain surgeons already, you know? But I did learn from them. And um, I, when I'm writing, I write a thousand words a day, which is just four pages. M when I was working on On Gold Mountain, I looked at my mother's papers at UCLA Special Collections, and in there was a letter he had, <laughs> my grandfather had written to my mother when she was in college, saying, you know, if you want to be a writer, um, you have to write a thousand words a day. And so he taught that to my mother, who taught it to me, and it's still the thing that I recommend to everyone. And, you know, I, I keep a notebook where I keep track when I'm, when I'm writing, because I'm not writing all the time. But when I'm actually working, I keep a notebook of how many words, and um, sometimes I can do it in about two hours. Sometimes it takes eight or 10. I know if it takes eight or 10, it's not very good. I mean, I know that, but I, I will stay there until I get to it. And sometimes I'm at like 985. Just please get me that last 15 words, but I will stay there until I get it done, even if later I have to cut it. But, it, but I, I don't, I just feel like I can always go back and fix something. But if you're sitting around waiting for the muse to visit you, she's busy. She's got other people to visit. You know, she's not coming to see me on her every day. So you just have to just, I mean, it's so basic, but you've just got to put your butt in a chair and, and do it, you know. And that, really and writing is thing. rewriting. And so yeah. you can't rewrite if you haven't already written it. Exactly. So, you know. I think people worry sometimes it has to be perfect and precious, you know, when you first but, put you it know, down. I do but it know doesn't. writers who make the first sentence perfect and the first paragraph perfect. And the, I, but I don't, you know, there's nothing wrong with it. I'm all for it, but I couldn't do it. Yes. Well, I don't have a mic, but I think you can hear. Two questions. First, how did you get an agent? First question, how did I get an agent? So way back in the day, I worked for Publishers Weekly, which was the uh, trade journal, is still the trade journal of the publishing industry. I mean, I was meeting a lot of people. Um, at that time, um, was right around the time Amy Tan was published and, you know, with uh, Joy Luck Club, her agent was in San Diego. This was somebody I kept bumping into. And then, you know, one night we were at dinner or some trade thing and talking and she said, you know, do you have a book in you? And that's how I got her. So, you know, that's not the usual way. And the second question? Well, first, my compliments on your writing. And your research, it was brilliant and very well done. And I think I should say that. Thank you. <laughs> you don't have to say it, but thank you. <laughs> Actually, my wife thinks the same thing. Um, and if my wife thinks it, I better. Um, that's a little different than the Chinese. Um, are you, your heritage is Chinese? Uh, part of it is, yes. So I grew up in a very large Chinese-American family in Los Angeles. I lived with my mother. Uh, my parents were divorced when I was three, but I lived with my mother. But I spent a, a tremendous amount of time with the Chinese side of my family. And back then, you know, when people were still having nine to 12 kids, um, the family was big. They, I had about 400 relatives in Los Angeles alone. And, you know, there were about a dozen that looked like me, the majority full Chinese, and then this spectrum in between. And so when I was a little kid, and my mom's family was tiny, like 10 people, and today left, I think it's like three. So really, you know, very different. And so when I looked around, what I saw were Chinese faces, what I experienced was Chinese culture, Chinese tradition, Chinese language, Chinese food, and that's why I write the kinds of books that I do. Hi, it's not really a question. I just wanted to mention if people haven't read Shanghai Girls or Dreams of Joy, we so enjoyed learning about the Cultural Revolution. It was those were two fabulous books. Thank you. I I'll pay you later. <laughs> Anybody back there? Here's someone. Everybody's shy. 
Hi there, Lisa. My name is Eva. Um, I've been in the U.S. for a long time, so I can't read or write Chinese. Uh, but reading your books has been really inspirational to learn about historical China. So I really appreciate that as well. My question to you is: Have there been any collaborations with the Chinese companies or anything about some of the dramas we see with, uh, like K dramas that you're mentioning? Maybe a historical drama based on one of your books. Yeah, so I've talked to different people over the years. I mean, uh, um, Snowflower and the Secret Fan was made into a film. It was one of only seven American films made in China that year. Um, it it wasn't very good. Um, um, Island of Sea Women is in development right now with a Korean company to be a television show. I actually just yesterday got the whole. I mean, you know, we're having a big writer strike right now, so nobody can work. Um, but um, this was something that had been completed before the strike, and I only just got it. But the whole outline for a five-year series. Uh, using T Girl of Hummingbird Lane, we'll see. You know, the strike has to end, and then they will go out and pitch it. But um, you, you never, you just never know what's going to happen. It, you know, we don't have a tradition in this country of doing much in the way of historical drama. I mean, apart from Yellowstone. <laughs> well, that's partly because it's really expensive. Yeah, it's very expensive. It's just very expensive, and. And so I, I just actually was in New York yesterday, and um, you know, at some point in that part of the trip, I met with my publisher and the uh, um, editor, and they were saying, you know, it's just too bad your books are so hard to turn into movies. I was like, well, I'm sorry, <laughs> but it, but it's you know, it, I have to write what I care about and. Um, sometimes when I look at things, I think, uh, sometimes like when stuff is set in the Ming dynasty, it doesn't look like what I think it should look like. For one thing, it's so much cleaner. Everything looks so clean, you know, and every, and I'm, you know, everybody had servants and people to wash their clothes, but y you know that everybody wasn't as all clean and pristine as that. Hi, I have a question. Um, as a female physician, I was absolutely enthralled um, by how your protagonists practice medicine and how some of the trials and tribulations of somebody practicing medicine then were even similar to what goes on today. And I was wondering if you could comment on that, because that really resonated with me. Well, thank you. But I think that goes back to what I said earlier. You know, if you if you have a baby inside there, it doesn't matter if that was 500 years ago or today or 500 years from now. There are only a couple ways it's going to come out. You know, I mean, actually, there's a variety of ways it can come out. But but. The, those ways are kind of universal and haven't changed over time. And I, I think one of the things that's so, uh, that really struck me as I was writing this was, um, like, I'll just say, uh, I had finished the first draft, and I think today is the first one year anniversary of, by date of the reversal of the, you know, the Dobbs decision. And that those discussions that people have been having now about women's health and who has control over women's bodies, the, this is not new. And people were talking about it 500 years ago. They were talking about it in the 1100s during Hildegard von Bingen's time, a Catholic nun who also wrote a couple of books about women's health and with, with all kinds of herbal recipes of you know, what to do if you have cramps, what if you want to try to get pregnant, what if uh, you want to end a, an unwanted pregnancy, a Catholic nun who wrote this. Uh, and I suspect if you went all the way back to caveman days, people were arguing over who has control over women's bodies. And if we jump ahead to when we're all living on Mars, 
they're still going to be talking about it. So I, I, I think there's some really basic parts that haven't changed and probably never will change over time. But thank you, because she's a physician. Oh, as soon as she said that, I was like, oh my god, what did I get wrong? <laughs> I was, I was like, geez. So, Lisa, I my question is very hangs on to that, and it has to do with all the herbal medicine and all the flowers and the pulses and what have you. What is true about all that? What did you find out? Did I mean, do people use that stuff nowadays? Is uh, it something? absolutely people use that now and. You know, it's much more prevalent here in the West than it used to be. Uh, certainly things like acupuncture, moxibustion, um, uh, a lot of those herbal remedies may not, people may not go to, to um, traditional Chinese medicine doctors for necessarily a cure, but they will go, let's say, if they're having cancer treatments and so, um, or, you know, chronic pain, that acupuncture is unbelievably great for chronic pain for people who are going through chemo. Um, I mean, I'm not advocating anything. I'm just saying what, what happens and, and that um, I think there's much more of, a, of an acceptance of uh, all what we could call alternative medicines and alternative ways of um, helping with symptoms than we used to have. And that most people, when they get really sick, and especially if they're sick in a very serious, life-threatening way, they people want to try whatever they think will work. And even if that's just about helping with certain symptoms. I have one. I just want to say thank you because I've really enjoyed the books that I've read. In high school, I read all the Pearl S book series and loved them. And it's nice to kind of come home to that. But I also want to tell you that it's so informative and instructive when I think about women during that time um, and men had control over their lives and they stayed in the inner circle and surrounded by other women and they could form they could form relationships, strong relationships, but other, I would never have survived, but uh, with all those women all the time. But what, I'm re what I realize is that, so these women forged ahead with their own ideas of their own lives, like your protagonist, and, and um, even though she was in, you know, with her mother-in-law and everything, and one of my favorite parts was the advice about be, be a dragon you know, so you just wait for your time and you don't, you don't say anything, you just observe. And then when the time is right, you come out. And you, I just wish I had read this when I was working with just all women. It would have helped, but thank you. Well, thank you. I, I just, um, I want to say something about the mother-in-law, which is, who and and I think this is a kind of recurring character in many of my books. Do Sang in um, Island of Sea Women certainly. Uh, I, I could go through other ones um, that they appear one way at the beginning, but they do have a role to play. And certainly, the mother-in-law in this book is not what she appears to be at at the at the beginning. And I remember in uh, Snowflower and the Secret Fan, that was also a particular kind of mother-in-law. And um, there's one point where she said, you know, it's all about obedience, obedience, obedience. And then she said, but there's one point where she says, obey, 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 and then do what you want. And that is something I have really internalized, you know, and that was a new shoe saying, you know, this something that had survived out of that secret writing. And I just think that's such a great, I mean, hopefully women don't feel the same kind of need or hey, uh, need or responsibility and to have to obey in the same way that we did. Um, but but we do have certain kinds of responsibilities that we do have that are kind of prescribed and conscribed and that we sometimes have to do stuff that we don't necessarily want to do 
just because we're, you know, you're a wife or you're a mother or whatever. And, and, um, but I'd like that there's that way out, you know, obey, 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 and then do what you want. Do what you want. So I have a word of wisdom for you, which is I, my husband and I have been married for decades without killing each other. And um, we agreed at the outset on a very simple rule, which I pass on. He who cares the most gets to win. And in almost any argument, one person actually does care more than the other. And you can figure out who it is. And that has, you know, uh, worked out extremely well over time. And I think that applies in some senses to Lady Tan. She has the same attitude in the book towards many things. Right. And she, when she does have these disagreements with her husband or even her mother-in-law, there are some times when she can't, she doesn't get what she wants, right. but other times when she is able to persevere sure. and her need does outweigh what the rules are. Yep. So thank you all very much for your attention. <laughs> so before we move on to book signing, I always like to give away a book. Usually it's an advanced reading copy that I have that I'm going to share. Amy, could you tell me, or John or somebody, how many numbers did we give away? 